So where are we with testing? Well, as of about 8 p.m. today, March 16th, um, by all accounts, we had done less than 50,000 tests in the United States. And that's problematic for a bunch of reasons because you know, we probably need to be doing 50,000 tests a day. We don't just want to be testing people according to the current guidelines that the CDC has put forth. At least that's my opinion. And it's actually the opinion of a lot of smart people I've spoken with who I think know much more than me about the spread of infectious diseases. So currently the CDC is saying, look, if you have a cough, if you are short of breath, if you have a fever, by all means, we'll test you. Um, I would add to that something very important. If you have none of the above, but you've been in contact with someone who has that, in an ideal world, we would test you. In other words, if we weren't rate limited on the number of tests we had, we would be able to test far more people. And remember what we talked about in previous videos, which is this virus can stay dormant for a very long period of time. In fact, one of the analyses we're going through now is trying to truly understand how dormant this virus can be in people who are symptomatic and asymptomatic. Now, there's plenty of literature that talks about what a symptomatic person can do vis-a-vis -vis shedding virus. And those numbers look really quite frightening. Um, so frightening, in fact, that I am scrutinizing the hell out of them with the team to make sure that we're not over-interpreting this. But we're talking about viral shedding that can last for 24 days, up to 30 days potentially in someone who's infected. Um, and also there's a paper that came out recently that looked at the aerosolized spread of the virus, um, being able to do things that, you know, frankly, um, I don't want to extrapolate yet because they're under certain laboratory conditions that I don't think mimic the real, real world. Um, so I'm going to come back to that if, you, if you'll forgive me for not getting into that now. I will come back to that later this week when we've scrutinized that a little bit more. But all of this is to say that you can be asymptomatic and you can shed the virus. You can be mildly symptomatic and look like you have any sort of other, you know, constellation of upper respiratory tract infections and be shedding the virus. So it, it really is important that we kind of identify folks. Now, in the previous video, I talked about how the, for reasons I don't understand, the CDC decided to make their own test as opposed to, you know, looking at the companies in China that have been doing this and doing it very well in a demonstrated way. Um, and I've heard arguments, well, it's national security, we can't rely on the Chinese test. I, I just, I find that to be a weak and hollow argument. I think in times like this, um, I, I have seen no indication that the Chinese are hiding data or doing anything nefarious, and therefore I think it was a strategic error to not rely on their testing. Nevertheless, why, why, did the, why did the CDC end up bagging on their tests? Well, what is sensitivity, right? We throw these words around. It's important to understand what they mean. Sensitivity is the probability that the test will be positive if the person, in fact, has the virus. So it's the true positive rate. So a sensitivity test of 90% means if you took 100 people that had the virus, 90 of them would actually test positive. That's great. The problem is 10 of them will test negative. They will falsely test negative. What is specificity? Specificity is effectively the reciprocal concept of that. It's the true negative rate. So it's the probability that somebody who is negative tests negative. So similarly, a sensitivity of 85%, pardon me, a specificity of 85% means if you took 100 people that absolutely didn't have the virus, 85 of them would come back with a negative test. That's great. But 15 of them would show up with a test that's positive. That's a false positive. So you can see from this sort of basic analysis that you want a test that has very high sensitivity and very high specificity, but you'll never get perfect on both. You just have to have both of them be high enough that your negative predictive value and your positive predictive value are very high. Now, I would argue in this case, negative predictive value is the most important thing. Why? So what is negative predictive value, by the way? Negative predictive value is the true negatives divided by the true negatives times the false negatives of any given test. So obviously, the fewer false negatives you have, the more that number approaches one. The same is true for positive predictive value. It's the true positives over the total positives, uh, pardon me, the, well, the total positives, the false positives plus the true, uh, true positives, false positives, true positives. And again, as that approaches one, it's telling you that your false positives are approaching zero. But let's go back to this true negative issue. Why is negative predictive value important? In a test like this, you don't want somebody who has the virus to test negative. 
Because what is that person going to do? They're going to go right back out and infect other people unknowingly. So if you're going to err on the side of one of these tests, you'll take higher negative predictive value over higher positive predictive value. Why? You might say, well, but Peter, how could you want to miss somebody who's positive? Remember, somebody who's positive and symptomatic who tests negative, you're going to be treating. So uh, again, you want to sort of think through these things like who's the, who is the, what's the most dangerous scenario to miss? The most dangerous scenario to miss is the person who's positive, not symptomatic, can fall through the cracks. Um, of course, the flip side is, is also, I'm not saying it's not a problem, which is someone's negative, but they test positive, they're forced into a quarantine. Yes, that's awful, but if you have to pick between one of those two scenarios, you're really gonna wanna minimize these false um, negatives. So um, hopefully this kind of feeds into the idea of why testing matters and why you wanna be able to do it at a pretty massive scale. I wanna be clear, I I'm still kind of optimistic. Now, maybe I'm being naive, but I haven't fully bought into the analyses that say, you know, 50% of Americans are gonna be infected by this virus in a year. And there are lots of people that are saying things like that. In fact, today, Goldman Sachs basically came out and talked about 5% economic contraction in Q2. A big part of their assessment is the rate of spread of this virus. Um, and, and I mean, they could be right, but I guess my point is like, we still probably have a chance to slow the rate of growth. Um, we're, we're still in the exponential phase, phase, uh, phase of growth, um, but there is a chance it doesn't have to go on unabated for another two weeks in exponential growth. And the difference of growing for 13 days versus 14 days exponent exponentially is enormous when you consider the rates of growth in exponential growth. So uh, use a simple problem like how quickly does something double? Right, so if you double something from one to two to four to eight to 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, you do that math enough, you realize that at some point you're getting to a number like the difference between one million and two million. And that's just one more doubling time. And if you go back from two million to one million and go back one more, it's half a million and it's 250,000 and it's 125,000. So these things start to come down very quickly. So time is of the essence. And again, my hope with this rant is that people sort of appreciate that testing is going to be important. My sincere hope is that the states take over um, and that they have the right to use any test that meets an FDA standard, even if it is not the designated company that has been selected as a partner.